project that I've been working with uh, Patricia and Aaron and Peter and David. It's a collaboration between Newcastle University and uh, Queen's University Belfast. So, in terms of the overview or what to expect, so you'll know where I am in terms of timing. If I haven't got to a certain point, then you know I'm going to start dancing around too. Uh, we'll talk about, or I'll talk about why rock art, uh, sort of give you an idea of the project chronology, look at some of the methods and results, uh, looking at the monitoring system that we've developed, uh, identify some conclusions and some recommendations. Um, we've heard about the love for rivers, the love for peat. Uh, uh, it is a certain degree the love for rock art because uh, of Aaron Maisel, who's, who's on the project with us. So he helped identify the resource that we're looking at. But rock art is uh, a, a strong um, resource in the landscape uh, for prehistoric heritage in the UK. It is a non-renewable resource. There is a common misconception that rock art is resilient. Um, and as a result, it's received uh, less conservation attention than other types of archaeological heritage resources in this country or generally across the world. So there is a need for continuous safeguarding. Um, if we look at rock art as being resistant, people will say, it, it's old, it has to be resistant. But it's not necessarily resistant, or rather it has been resistance because of a number of variables. Uh, it's because of the rock that was chosen. If the rock that was chosen is, is going to last, well, we can see the rock art in the landscape now. But it's also lasted because there's not been a, a large amount of human populations in the rural landscape in which you find rock art. There's been relatively low agricultural activity. And as we heard uh, earlier, there's only been a certain amount of change uh, in, in temperature precipitations over the last 60 years. So before then, there was a certain amount of consistency. But uh, these factors are changing. So these, we heard about risk uh, multipliers. These are risk multipliers that are going to impact uh, the resistance of the rock art in the landscape. So if you look at the chronology, we've been looking at primarily um, ancient stone monuments or stone decay since 2009. And we've had a series of uh, activities where we've looked at stone decay. I'm going to go through that chronology, provide you the results, because it's important to look at the results over time, because our interpretation has changed as more data has come in, uh, which has changed how we're going to, uh, what we're saying about rock art. Uh, in 2009, we um, had a, a project where we looked at uh, all ancient stone monuments, primarily in the UK. We pulled in a lot of collaborators to, to look at the effects or to identify what sort of climate and environmental conditions should be studied. We wanted to look at how we could um, look at the treatment of reducing stone decay. We wanted to look at monitoring systems, and we had a cluster research grant, so we pulled in all the people. We had a great discussion over two days, as you do with these sort of networking cluster groups, and then everyone went home. But fortunately, we did um, make some connections, and primarily we made connections um, with Patricia Work at Belfast, and what we found was that we wanted to move our information forward by taking on a condition assessment and risk evaluation the nice acronym of CARE. So we wanted to take a CARE approach forward for looking at uh, stone monuments in the landscape and narrowing in on rock art because that was where Aaron was saying that we needed to go. So we wanted to take a CARE approach as, as the foundation for sound research. Um, we wanted to understand the current conditions. Uh, we wanted to understand mechanisms. And we knew that uh, built structures already had a, a vast amount of available tools available from which we could draw on to, to modify, to look at rock art. In fact, Patricia and her colleagues have published quite a bit on, on uh, looking at built structures and staging conditions, and we decided to go with a staging approach because Patricia, before she became a geomorphologist, was a nurse. And, and key to her heart, or a lot of what she was doing, was looking at staging systems for cancer patients. And that universal approach where if you know what your stage is, you know what the situation is, and you know what sort of interventions you can apply, any doctor knows what to do. So that was our approach. We thought we wanted to have something similar that we could use uh, to look at rock art. We wanted it to be easy. 
We wanted it to be so anyone could use it. You didn't have to have special skills to apply it. We wanted, to, wanted it to be universal and standardized. <coughs> and, and this was, uh, so, so that was the staging tool that was driving this forward. We also know that stone weathering um, is influenced by a number of different factors. Uh, and it's hard to predict. So you can have states where everything is quite stable, and then all of a sudden it changes. And when that change occurs, that step change, it's rapid and quick, and then everything can stabilize again. And so there's a whole series of, uh, well, it's nonlinear and there's step changes. Um, so what we wanted to do was to uh, look at the condition now and see how that might relate to past and future conditions. So that was where we were what we were thinking. In 2011, we had a, a, a student from the environmental engineering uh, program working with David Graham, who collected a series of environmental parameters on 18 uh, rock art panels at two locations in uh, North, Northumberland, which is in Northeast England. She applied a condition stage approach to analyzing the panels, the rock art, um, and she wanted to con compare the environmental uh, metrics with the stage information. And she also wanted to do some um, climate modeling to look at the future. The results of that 2011 work was that, uh, so we did condition assessment, we had uh, four stages, we divided those in two to <coughs> low, um, low weathering, uh, or less weathering, and more weathering, we compared those and we found out that panels that were high, had a, were high in the landscape had a, a greater wear pattern or stage score. We also found that uh, panels were more weathered in soil that had higher salt content. We then looked at some of the predicted modeling uh, that come out there. We, talked, we heard about this earlier on. There's going to be higher wind speeds, more intense seasonality. <coughs> um, and this was quite, all of a sudden it was like, okay, if we're going to have this happening where there's going to be more wind, more weather, then it's going to affect those panels that are higher in the landscape. So there's the prediction that those items or those panels in the landscape are going to be more prone to weathering. We then moved on to 2012 where we did, uh, Sadie Nelson did some additional work. She, uh, we, with her, we gathered some uh, XRF data and we, non-destructive analysis of the content of the rock art. We then looked at staging. We were refining that a little bit as well. And we wanted to do some comparisons of the XRF data and the scores. First of all, what we found was that there was uh, less variation across individual panels, which meant that individual panels are unique, which was important to then make some comparisons across panels. Um, we um, found out that the intermediate <coughs> stage panels, those that were scoring about two and a half on our scale from one to four at the time, were more susceptible to sudden change. And if you look at the, the ratio of uh, silica to iron, that shows you that, um, the, yes, that. Uh, those that are in the middle are more prone to, to change, to sudden change. So this is just sort of a reiteration of what I said before. <coughs> in 2013, we then uh, gathered some additional data. We wanted to refine our care tool because at that point we had condition assessment, but we didn't have so, many, uh, so much information about the risk variables integrated into it. We wanted to create a, a, a tool that was user friendly, so we collaborated with a wide range of uh, stakeholders, and we wanted to create a guidance tool that was usable by the, state, the, the um, custodians of the rock art who made decisions about their management. And then these were some of the other. We wanted to disseminate our results like I'm doing today. Uh, so we gathered information from England, Scotland, and Ireland. We visited 18 sites uh, across three different counties. We looked at 78 rock art panels. We gathered soil, and we continue to gather information about the XRF. And we wanted to have this scientific grounding to our research. So we, like you saw those river pictures, here's some of our pretty pictures of rock art that we went out and we analyzed. So there's a lot of different types of rock art in the landscape in the UK and Ireland. So that was, that was a pleasure to get out and see. 
What we found was looking at risk, well, there were some quick risk factors that we could calculate into our tool. tool. It's kind of hard to see, but there's a lot of traffic there by cattle. Um, up there, you can see the feeders were placed on top of the rock art panels. So they were feeding the cattle, and they were walking all over the rock art. You can see uh, some clearing, and you can clearly see the, the scarring along the rock art panel up there. This is a trackway where they're driving across the, the rock art panels, because if you need to cross the landscape, and you're going to fall into mud or, walk, or drive across rock, well, you'll drive across rock. And then just some storage of some uh, farm equipment um, and uh, building structures. So we were able to identify a, a wide range of variables. So again, we went out and we did our consultation. We, we consulted rock art enthusiasts that knew something about rock art, that were out there doing some surveys already. We talked to people that didn't even know what rock art was because we wanted to have something that worked. Uh, we talked to heritage professionals and we talked to the landowners because we knew if we created a tool that um, they didn't buy into, they would never use. And we wanted to make sure it was user friendly. We created a tool that had 17 variables that we recorded that would help us with this triage approach to identifying different conditions where people needed to act. So our most recent data shows, well, this is the distribution based upon motif condition, and we're finding that motifs in England are slightly better related to conditions if you look at Scotland and Ireland. And if you look at it, I know it's kind of bold of us to say that that dot way up there equals all of England, and that dot down there that is south of the dot for England up north is all of Scotland, and, and that dot over there, which is slightly off, should be done a little further. No, yeah, is, is Ireland, but we're trying to, we're making some generalizations there. So here we have the results there. They're not, it's not, I think more, more sites in Scotland were weathered than, than what we had thought. We then went back and compared the data types that we had in our earlier analysis. So we looked at panel height. Um, and in fact, what we found and reported on earlier, previously in 2012, doesn't necessarily hold true for other locations. So we need to revise what, what we're saying about panel height. Uh, we need to understand what are the other factors that influence panel height and why it's different in places like Scotland. We also see that there is a difference between the soil content, as, excuse me, the salt content as well, between the high uh, staged panels and the low stage panels. In terms of our, thank you, in terms of our preliminary results for our XRF, we're finding that the iron to salt ratio, which we thought would, would explain the weathering aspect of the stone, doesn't necessarily hold true either. <laughs> so a lot of what we've published is now sort of, is not clear. So what we asserted before, based upon more data, is saying, ah, this pattern is tricky. So, the, if I go back to this slide here, what, I, what we can say is the data for the locations, for that location is really good and provides you some good information at a local level, but you can't generalize across different locations. And in fact, it's probably the actual locational information, because if you look at the, the geology, the bedrock, a lot of what we're seeing might be better explained, because it's different types of bedrock. And you need to understand the actual, it is location, but it's actually the makeup of the stone that might better explain some of the, the patterns of decay. Uh, than what we thought before. So I'm rushing through this. Uh, so in terms of conclusions, um, we, we, we argue that rock art is not as resistant as one might think. There are many factors that play into the current overall condition. Um, and that relationship of panel weathering and environmental parameters is not linear. Therefore, the interpretation of what it means is challenging. Um, really what we need is or are more data to help us understand the patterns and trends that we're seeing. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, we've created a tool that can help managers make decisions about interventions to the care of the rock art, which is on their land. 
we would suggest there are certain things that you might want to do from sheltering panels, which to be quite honest, you don't want to put a shelter out in landscape to protect a panel, but there are ways in which you can make some recommendations if that side or that panel is, is a very high uh, or unique rather uh, panel in the landscape. And we've come up with some, some immediate um, interventions for environmental controls around the panel. And many of these are logical things like don't put your cattle feeders on top of rock art panels. <laughs> and that's something that is easy to correct. It doesn't cost money. And at the end of the day, it's going to make a huge difference to the long-term uh, preservation of that, that panel in the landscape. So those are my conclusions. So our, what are our recommendations? Well, our recommendations are to gather more data. And it's not an academic exercise because we want to be paid more, we want more grants. But really to understand what's going on, we have to have more data. And we, don't, we, we can take different types of data as well to help understand that story through time of the rock art panels. What we've done is we did create this nice report that you can download online in a few days' time. I was hoping to have it done before we came here, but we didn't get there. You can download that, or what we've done is we've taken it and we've put it into a mobile app. So all you have to do is download the free app, put in those 17 variables, it'll tell you your GPS location, it even tells you it has a tilt meter on it, gives you all sorts of information, because we're, we're collecting a little bit more data than what we thought, so does the motif angle make a difference? Um, what about lichen and algae? and moss, what are the role of those? We don't know yet. Some people predict they mean something if there's a certain type of this or a certain type of that. So we're gathering the data to have more information so we can expand our interpretation. So in addition to having it as a mobile app, we have a portable location, or portal rather, uh, on the internet where you can, uh, well, once you've finished your app, it transfers it to the portal. Anyone can download and do the, the report. It is stockpiled here. <coughs> a limited number of people, the owners of sites, we have English here, uh, Historic England uh, in Scotland, so they can download the information and we have a score card for triage approach. When it says red, it's at risk. So that is the end of my talk. So maybe we'll have a